Good evening to all our viewers in India and the Middle East, and good morning to those watching from the United States. On behalf of Streams of Water, I welcome you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Raven, and I'll be your host for this program. I hope you're all doing well, both in health and in the Lord in the midst of this pandemic. We have a very special guest today. His name is Dr. Darrell Bock. He is a senior research professor of New Testament studies and also executive director of cultural engagement at the Hendrick Center in Dallas Theological Seminary. He is the author of over 40 books on a wide range of biblical and cultural topics, including well-regarded commentaries on Luke and Acts. He regularly speaks on these topics and serves as a consulting editor for Christianity Today. He is married to Sally with three children and four grandchildren, and uh, he has a special love for sports, including cricket. <laughs> Dr. Bob, welcome to the program. It's an honor for us to have you. Well, I think that introduction was a six, so we're in good shape. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let me just jump right in here and ask you to help us to set the stage here. Jesus the Messiah has come, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death, rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, and poured out his spirit. And the New Testament writers consistently affirm that the last days have begun. Uh, what do they mean by that, Dr. Bach? Would you please explain to us? Well, in Scripture, uh, you can think about this just in relationship to the Old and New Testaments. There's the period of promise looking forward to God's work of restoration of the creation, and then there's the period of realization. And so, um, really, the last days, biblically defined, started when Jesus came to earth in his ministry. And, of course, the anticipation had been that when he came the first time, at least the anticipation of many was, when he came the first time, that he would come and complete the work of restoration with his appearance on the earth. And, of course, what the New Testament tells us is there is a first coming and there is a second coming. So there's what Jesus has done and there's what Jesus will do. Sometimes this is connected to the language of the kingdom of God, and we say that the kingdom of God is already and not yet. Some of it has come and some of it is yet to come. And so the last days, the doctrine of the last days, what's called eschatology because all theology needs technical terminology so that no one can understand what you mean. Uh, the term eschatology means the doctrine of the last days, the doctrine of last things. And so that period starts with the realization of the promise in Jesus' first coming, but it culminates with everything associated with Jesus' return in the second coming. All right. So the biblical writers also use terms like the end or the day. Uh, for example, the writer of the Hebrews is asking us not to neglect to meet together, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And Peter says, uh, the end of all things is at hand. Paul, writing to the Romans, he says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So, Dr. Bob, uh, would you please uh, take some time to explain to us, what are these people, all these New Testament writers referring to when they call the day or the end? Well, the day or the end has to do with all the events associated with the return of Christ, the vindication of the righteous, judgment of evil, the establishment of righteousness, and everything that comes with the return in the completion of the work of restoration that Jesus has been involved in ever since he, was, he came to earth as the incarnate word of God. So, so the day sometimes refers very specifically to the day of the Lord, which is a day of reckoning and a day of judgment. Um, you mentioned before how sometimes uh, the last days gets mentioned, and you mentioned the book of Hebrews. In the very beginning of the book of Hebrews, there's the statement about in these last days he has sent his son. And so uh, that shows you how last days, if you will, bridges the time from Jesus' initial coming to the time of this consummation that the phrase the day or the end talks about. And the end is, uh, is the end of this history. Of course, it's not the end because uh, everyone goes into eternity. So there is, in one sense, no end. But this history and this program has an end when Jesus comes, returns, establishes his presence on the earth, uh, 
reckons in a final judgment and then creates the new heaven and the new earth. The consummation itself, and of course we may discuss, end up discussing this, um, is viewed differently by Christians in terms of whether it's what I call a one-step consummation. We just go directly into the new heavens and the new earth. That's known as amillennialism, no millennium. Or there's an intermediate kingdom of a thousand years, and then there's a new heaven and a new earth. That's called premillennialism because Jesus returns before the thousand-year intermediate earthly kingdom, and then we move to a new heaven and a new earth. And Christians are, are divided on teaching about the end times as to whether that intermediate kingdom exists or not. That has to do with how interpretation uh, is involved with what looks to be be the description of a very earthly and physical kingdom in the Old Testament involving Israel at the center of kind of that drama um, and how to incorporate that into what the New Testament teaches as it talks about eternal life. And some people say that's been folded into the eternal picture, that's the amillennial view, and other people say no, that intermediate kingdom on earth is part of the story and that is the premillennial view. So you will meet Christians who belong in one of those two camps, and thus, the reason I went through that aside, they will see the day slightly differently in terms of what's involved with it. All right. So that was a very clear explanation, Dr. Buck. Uh, what is your view on this, the day? I, I hold to the intermediate kingdom, that there is an intermediate kingdom, which Revelation has labeled as a millennium, and so often it's called the millennium uh, to represent a thousand years. Uh, I'm more interested in the idea that there is such an intermediate kingdom and that it has a physical location on the earth and that it completes this history and completes promises and commitments that God made within this history uh, to be realized than to make the other choice, which is to say we just simply go into the new heavens and the new earth. There are too many descriptions, I think, in the Old Testament with the New Testament referring back and saying, if you want to know what comes with Jesus' return. This is particularly clear in Acts 3, verses 18 to 22. Uh, if you want to know, heaven must hold Jesus until the Messiah returns, and if you want to read about that return, you can read about that return in the prophets of old. So we're not told to reconfigure that reading, and that looks at a, a very physical, intermediate kingdom, the Messiah ruling from Jerusalem. There are a lot of parts to it, but uh, in Isaiah also you get the picture of a highway built from Egypt to Assyria, but everyone right. gathering in Jerusalem to worship the Lord. Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 19 uh, deal with those themes. And so I just don't see a way to uh, handle that any differently than to see it as what it is describing. So that's called the Millennial Kingdom. That's right. It's called the Millennial Kingdom. And now we only get the term Millennium from Revelation 20. So up to that point, it's been understood to be this intermediate kingdom or the consummation of the promise on earth a variety of ways to describe it it doesn't get a label but in revelation 20 it gets described as the millennium and and then that title gets uh, if you will projected backwards into the, the scripture to describe what the millennial kingdom what the intermediate kingdom is it becomes the millennium as a result right so dr Bob, coming back to the language of the last days uh, you mentioned that uh, the last days are the ones that began with the coming of Jesus, the first coming, and uh, they end with the second coming of Jesus. So we are right now living in the last days and moving towards the day of his coming, isn't it? Yes, and we're in what's called, well, we could be called in the tweener zone, you know. Uh, 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 some people might even see it as the twilight zone, but the point is there's this, we're in this tension between what God is making out of his people in the church as he's drawing them towards this time on the one hand, but the fact that that work is not completed on the other. So, uh, you know, so we still deal with sin. Righteousness is present, but there still is evil to deal with, etc. So we're in this tension zone. This tweener zone is a tension zone in which some of the promise is still left to be uh, made real, even though some of the benefits of what is are associated with that promise have been distributed. And, and so that's the context in which the church finds itself. And the church is supposed to be, as a community, a sneak preview of where what the kingdom will be and where God's people are headed in terms of how they're supposed to engage with God and live their lives. 
we're supposed to be an audiovisual demonstration of the presence and activity of God in the midst of the world. That's another calling that the church has and that she's supposed to live out in this in-between time. Right. Um, so, Dr. Bach, uh, when I see the New Testament, there is a sense of urgency in the message of the New Testament writers. Uh, the end of all things is at hand, is near. Uh, does that apply to us as we live here now? Yeah, it's applied to every Christian since the day Christ came. And uh, there are also other passages that show attention with this idea. There's a very fascinating passage in Luke 18 in which the remark is made that God will vindicate his people or justice will come soon on the one hand. But on the other hand, what's said is, is that when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? So there is this recognition on the one hand that it's the next thing on the calendar. It, you know, it kind of lines up in terms of what the sequence is and, and the return is very much in the front end of the queue. But on the other hand, it will be long enough that some people will wonder, is it really ever going to happen? And so that tension is never resolved in Scripture. In Acts 1, you get the question from the disciples, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In Acts 1, 6. And Jesus responds by saying, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that are in the Father's hands. And so basically his answer is, it's none of your business and God knows the timing. There's another very famous passage in the Gospels where Jesus says, no one knows the time of the return, not even the Son. And uh, I have no idea how entirely to resolve that. Uh, but other than it signals the fact that this timing of the return is certain, but it's in God's timing, even though it's next on the calendar. So the next on the calendar produces the urgency. But the overall teaching says you can't know when this time is going to be. So it gets described, that time gets described as being prepared for a thief coming in the night. Um, you can't be prepared for it. And so the best way to be prepared for it is to live in a way that is honoring to God, to be watchful, to be awake and aware, uh, but to continue on with the mission that God has given you in the meantime. And that's actually how Acts 1-8 resolves the tension of the question, you know, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? On the one hand, Jesus says, not for you to know the times and the seasons, but in the meantime, you're going to be equipped with the Spirit of God, and your calling is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, starting in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so that is the assignment and the calling that the church has until um, this end and the resolution of the end comes, and then we minister to Jesus directly. I like to joke about the end times that no one's going to debate who the Pope is, when Jesus returns. <laughs> so, Dr. Bach, uh, living in the tension that you talked about uh, right now, as a Christian living right now in this part of history, I cannot think that I have a lot of time on my hands in dally with sin, right? That's right. I mean, the, ten the tension of the way in which the return is taught is on the one hand, uh, you know, he could come at any moment, uh, and we don't know when that time is. And then on the other hand, you know, we could be living until 3000 BC. I mean, I would say 3000 BC, 3000 AD. Yeah. And so, uh, so the point is, you live with the possibility of his imminent return on the one hand, but you carry out the mission and plan long term on the other because you don't know exactly when it's going to be. And this is this tension that I keep describing is part of the reality of what the New Testament teaches about the Christian walk because we don't have resolution in terms of knowing exactly when that return is going to be. So you live with a sense of the imminent return of Christ and Christians have done that since the time of Jesus first coming. So that's lasted, you know, 2,000 years. That's a, in one sense a long time. Uh, but in any life of any person, they live in the midst of that tension. Right. So, Dr. Bach, would you please explain to us what are the characteristic features of these last days that we talked about? Well, now this is addressed in uh, a discourse that Jesus gave that's known as the Olivet Discourse. This came at the end of Jesus' ministry, and he signaled a lot of things that were associated with the end 
uh, really beginning from the time that he gave the speech, because in Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus doesn't tell the signs by moving forward, but he gives some, and then he comes back towards the time of the disciples, and then he moves forward towards the end, which most people may not recognize about that speech. So he talks about things like people claiming to be Messiah, so messianic pretenders. He talks about uh, tension between nations. He talks about natural disasters, all those kinds of things. And some of the things on that list in the midst of the speech are said to not yet be the end. And then he, in Luke, he rolls back and he says, before those things that are not yet the end, there's going to be persecution of the church. You're going to have to stand before governors and rulers and give testimony to me, only you don't need to worry about what you're going to say. The Spirit's going to provide what you need to say. But you need to, in effect, hang in there and keep your faith. Some of you will die, but not... There's a wonderful juxtaposition in Luke that says some of you will die, some of you will be martyred, but not a hair on your head will be impacted. And I, I, you know, I'm sensitive about the way hair is described. And so, uh, and so in the midst of thinking about that, uh, you know, the point is, is that you may even lose your life, but you're not going to lose your eternal life. You're not going to lose your existence. And so you can stand up and be faithful in the midst of that situation. So having come back towards the apostles, I think some of that is described in the book of Acts, he then moves forward and says there's going to be um, disruption, significant disruption in the creation. It's going to make people very, very nervous when it happens. And then the Son of Man will return riding on the clouds is the picture. Uh, and, and another thing about that Olivet Discourse that's very, very important is, is that Jesus is actually dealing with two time periods simultaneously. He is describing events that lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 because he predicted that no stone would be left on another on, on, in the temple. Um, that triggered the speech because the disciples asked, okay, when's that going to happen? Uh, but that lead in to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 is mirrored by what will happen when he actually physically returns. This is what is known as a pattern prophecy or a mirror prophecy where something on the short end mirrors or patterns something that's going to happen at the end as well. And the two are so alike you can actually describe them simultaneously and put them on top of one another. That's what this speech does. And so it culminates in the prediction of the return of the Son of Man riding on the clouds. Son of Man is a way of referring to Jesus. Um, some of those passages talk about him returning uh, the Son of Man seated at the right hand, coming on the clouds, the picture of his rule alongside God, and, and then he's going to come and exercise judgment and gather the righteous. And so that's the picture of the end that we talked about originally, uh, and, the, and if you will, the beginning of the end, or the end of the beginning, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I like having fun turning a phrase every now and again, and that's an interesting one to think about. Anyway, in the return, uh, then the, the Son of Man comes back and he exercises judgment, sets up the rule, uh, again on the premillennial view, sets up the rule of the intermediate kingdom. Uh, Satan is bound for a time, righteousness reigns, he's loosed again in a perfect environment. Uh, again, there's a rebellion because we still have sin that we're dealing with. And then there's a final judgment, and then that leads into the new heavens and the new earth. So on the premillennial model, the return has two parts, and the end has two parts, if you will. Whereas, again, in the amillennial model, it just go directly to the new heavens and the new earth, and the judgment is a part of the end. So that's the difference among Christians about the end times that often gets discussed as one discusses this, kind, this topic. Yeah. I think we'll talk more about uh, the premillennial model uh, in the course of our conversation here. Uh, Dr. Bock, you mentioned about the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, so when Peter was writing these words, the end of all things is at hand. And uh, he also knew that Jesus had predicted about the destruction of Jerusalem. So he knew that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, but he also saw that the other things like Paul's messiahs were there, and uh, the gospel was going out, apostasy was there and all of that. Uh, in light of these two things, uh, Dr. Bach, that Jerusalem is not destroyed yet, and yet he sees some of these signs that Jesus talked about, uh, where is the reconciliation there when he said, 
uh, the end of all things is at hand still. Well, remember that there's a distinction here that's important, and that is that on the one hand, at least in the way that Matthew and Mark describe the Olivet Discourse, it is the temple that is being destroyed and not the entire city, although the mm -hmm. two are related to one another. But the focus is on the destruction of the temple. And in fact, in Matthew and in Mark, when this destruction is addressed directly, it is associated with the abomination of desolation of Daniel. In right. fact, in Matthew, the book of Daniel is actually explicitly mentioned, whereas in Mark, it just simply says, let the reader understand. Mm -hmm. And so this is the physical declaration, desecration of the, of the holy space, of the most holy space mm -hmm. in the temple, uh, ultimately by the Antichrist, although the picture of Rome under, overrunning the temple and destroying it is a picture of the same kind of thing. Now, Luke... Who's more, who in some ways is more interested on the front end of the pattern, the near realization of the pattern, as opposed to Matthew's looking at the back end of the pattern. Um, Luke, because he's focused a little bit more on AD 70, describes it as Jerusalem's desolation rather than mentioning the ten temple specifically. Uh, and so, um, so you get that difference. So in one case, you've got to focus on the siege of the city, which led to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And in the other case, you get the emphasis on the destruction coming in the temple and the desecration. You see the abomination of desolation standing where he should not be is actually the way Matthew words this. And so that is the picture of the Antichrist being in a place where he shouldn't be in the inside of the holy space of the temple. Um, and that is an offense to God that gets dealt with. And so that's the difference uh, within the discourse uh, that's going on, and that's why both the temple and Jerusalem are a part of the conversation about what's going to go on and what has gone on. Both, remember, both events are in view simultaneously uh, in, this, in this discourse that we call the Olivet Discourse because it was given on the Mount of Olives. So when we talk about these things as being the characteristic features of the last days, uh, wars, rumors of wars, even pandemics should not surprise us, right? That's correct. Uh, that uh, 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 pandemics or pestilences get mentioned specifically in uh, one of the forms of the discourse in Luke. Um, it's not mentioned in the parallels, but it's there. So. Uh, the disruption that's represented by a pandemic is part of it. Now, an important thing to recognize is, is that pandemics uh, have come and gone since the time of Christ. So the presence of a pandemic is not an automatic feature of the end. That's important to say. Um, but it, what it does indicate is the kind of disruption that's going to be like what happens at the end. And, of course, the global disruption that we've seen and that people are experiencing a very, you know, live and in color, if you will, uh, and the disruption that that represents and almost the disorientation that it brings is part of what is described as the mood that also will be associated with the end when it comes. All right. Dr. Bach, uh, just switching gears here, um, are there any definite unfulfilled events which must transpire before his return? Uh, that's a good question. Then um, the, um, the, the answer, short answer to that question is, according to the scriptural calendar, the next thing that comes is everything associated with the return of Jesus. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's, in one sense, nothing left to happen. You know, sometimes people say, well, the gospel's got to go into all the world. Uh, there's language in the Mark version, the Olivet Discourse, that gives that kind of language. And the problem becomes, what exactly, what exactly does that mean? Um, Paul, in the book of Colossians, said that the gospel was going into all the world. You know, he, mm -hmm. he saw it as something that was happening in his own time. His so, own time. How, so how comprehensive does that have to be to be in place versus, um, you know, has, that in, has the gospel made it into the world already? That's a good, it's a good question, and I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. Um, but having said that, um, the, the next thing on the calendar is the return. That's why we're told to await uh, what involves. And then once you ask, well, what are those events? 
just like we had with premillennial and amillennial, you've got a huge discussion about what that looks like in terms of the return. You, and this right. is related to a seven-year period called the tribulation period, which is the, often associated with the last or 70th week of Daniel. Um, and then there's various views on when Christ comes in relationship to that period of intense um, persecution and battling that comes at the very end before Jesus' return. And there's a view that's called premillennial. It says Jesus comes in the rapture for the church before that tribulation period. And thus, uh, people who are on earth who, believe, who are alive when, when this all begins will not experience the tribulation. That's pre-tribulationism. There's another view called mid-tribulation has Jesus coming in the middle of that. So they'll experience some of it, but they won't experience all of it. And then there's what's called a post-tribulational view, that Jesus comes back, gathers the church, and sets up the millennial kingdom all at once at the end of the tribulation period. In fact, he resolves the tribulation period in order to move into this kingdom period. That's known as post-tribulationism. And again, you have Christians who are all, all across the map in terms of knowing what to believe about those various things when it comes to discussing the end time. So you may be conceivably sitting next to someone in church or meet someone who's a believer, and they could be you know, anywhere on, on that map in terms of possibility. Now, I'm a pre-tribulationist, but uh, again, that's, this is something that is discussed among believers, and right. many ministries work side by side with one another in ministry, uh, despite the different views they might have about that detail about the end. Right. Thank you, Dr. Bob. So, uh, like you said, uh, I am a premillennial, pre-tribulationist too. I'm convinced from the scripture uh, about this particular position. So, Dr. Bob, uh, taking again the proclamation of the apostles that the Lord is near and applying that to our times, there is nothing in our experience that expressly prohibits our expectation. Uh, in fact, uh, what we see happening around us in the world makes our belief stronger that the end of all things is nearer than what it was before. The judge well, that, has, is that has to be. I mean, you know, the, every second that passes, you get closer to the end. So, I mean, that right. part of it, the hard part of it, of course, is, is that no one knows when that, when that arrival point is. And so even in the life of Paul, you know, 2,000 years before writing in the Thessalonians, he's writing in such a way in which he says, you know, those who are asleep in Christ are transformed when he's talking about Jesus' return and the, and the transformation that brings for people in the church. And those of us who are alive will be changed, you know. So he, right. he sees himself as experiencing the possibility of Jesus' return in his own lifetime. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is someone who was writing 2,000 years ago. Again, because it's the next thing on the calendar, but you don't know. It, it's like having a calendar with months on it, okay? But you don't know when you flip the page from one month to the next, oh, that's the month. Uh, so, you, so you just keep flipping till they come and knowing right. that it's possible that the next page is the page that, that, that will bring you redemption. Right. So it's perfectly all right to say we don't know when he's coming, but he could come any moment. Exactly right. And that's, the, that's called the teaching of the eminence of Jesus' return. Uh, and really, in one way or another, as strange as it may sound, all the views that I have been discussing that Christians have, have a belief in some form of eminence, you know, mm -hmm. provided they believe that Jesus is coming back again. I mean, that, right. and, and almost everybody does. We just did a poll of pastors here in the United States about the end times, about eschatology. Um, the Hendricks Center did this with Chosen People Ministries and, and the Joshua Fund. And if we all went together to Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, all went together to produce this poll. And 97% of the pastors believe in a literal physical return of Jesus, which leads me to ask the question, what are the other 3% thinking? But anyway, uh, the point here is that that uh, that there's this physical return and the idea that it could happen at any time really is something that Christians share across the board, no matter which particular sub view of the return in the end times they possess. And I'm trying to be very descriptive here of the variety of Christians on purpose, because even though I have my own views and and you have yours, 
and they're very specific and, and have set out one calendar. There are believers who, uh, who think uh, differently, and it used to be, in some contexts, that was a basis for separating in ministry together in doing the calling that we have to take the gospel into the world. And um, frankly, I just don't think that's, that's healthy or, or in, in that sense, biblical. We can talk among ourselves about what we think the end is like and make the case for what we believe in. We ought to do that, that's important to do. But we shouldn't make it a basis for separating from someone who shares Christ uh, and the redemption of Christ that, that uh, is the gift of God and that we all share in that gift. Right. That is, those of us who believe in Christ. Right. Dr. Bob, would you please uh, take some time to explain the connection between the last days that we were talking about and the age to come? Is there an overlap there? Uh, yeah, the age to come is, this, is what comes with the consummation, basically. So, mm -hmm. um, so Jesus... <laughs> Jesus' return sets up the age to come. And then again, we're back to the earlier conversation. How should one conceive of the age to come? A premillennial sees the age to come coming in those two steps, the intermediate kingdom and then the new heavens and the new earth, and an amillennial sees it in one step coming all at once with no intermediate kingdom. And that's, that is uh, one of the differences. So let me just say this. The reason I think premillennialism is more likely than amillennialism is because in the Old Testament, there are very specific descriptions about the way on earth um, he's, the Messiah is going to rule from Jerusalem. He's going to come to the Mount of Olives. Uh, there's going to be this highway running from Egypt to Assyria, which is important mm -hmm. because it pictures opponents to Israel who now are brought into the people of God and they all share in the worship of God. You know, there are these very specific earthly grounded pictures of what the end is going to be like. Now, there is a new heaven and a new earth in the amillennial view, so you can, you can do this, but it looks, at what tends to happen in amillennialism is the role of Israel as the hub for this activity gets washed out in the process, and, and so it isn't quite as, it doesn't deal with all the features that you're seeing in the Old Testament uh, right. that, that uh, premillennialism does. So that's you know, if someone pushes me and says, okay, well, why are you premill versus amill? That's the reason why. So the age to come is everything associated with what comes with Jesus' second coming. So at least you can you know, terminologically connect the two ideas. So, Dr. Bok, uh, isn't there an overlap between this age and the age to come? Because uh, when you see the language of the New Testament that the Spirit is given already, we have the forgiveness of sins. The new covenant in some sense has begun. Uh, would you please talk about that? Well, again, we've talked about how the fact that we've got the last days, okay, the last days have been implemented. But the age to come is still the age to come. So, um, so there's that distinction. So if you ask me, are we in the last days? Yes. Are we participating in eschatological benefits? Yes. Have we experienced all the eschatological benefits we're going to receive as the people of God? The answer to that question is no. Uh, is Jesus physically ruling on the earth in a visual presence kind of way? The answer to that question is no. So everything that I've answered no belongs in the age to come, and everything that I've answered yes and no belongs in eschatology. So uh, if that didn't confuse you, nothing will. But, uh, but the point is... Uh, uh, the idea of eschatology is a bigger idea in terms of where we stand than the idea of the age to come, which is yet to be uh, triggered and therefore uh, lies ahead of us. Right. Uh, but the age of the spirit has already begun. The, the benefits are already there. Isn't it? Uh, the two key benefits that we have received already that are part of new covenant promise from the Old Testament are the forgiveness of sins and the right, what, what Jeremiah describes as the writing of the law in the heart, what Ezekiel describes as a washing and I will put my spirit within you. I mean, baptism actually pictures this. Uh, it pictures the cleansing that we have and, uh, you know, we go down in the water and we die to sin and we come up in new life. Well, what makes that difference? That difference is the picture of the washing or the cleansing, which if you think Jewishly for a second, if you're an unclean vessel, 
you cannot attend and be in the presence of God uh, at the temple. So the picture of a washing is a picture that takes you from unclean to being clean. And because you're a clean vessel now, the Spirit of God can reside within you and makes you holy, sets you apart, makes you a saint, to use the language of the New Testament. And you become part of this sacred, set-apart, sanctified, that is cleansed, community, set-apart community that becomes uh, the church, which is viewed as a pictured as a holy temple of God. So all that imagery goes together, and all that is a result of the arrival of the new covenant, which has forgiveness of sins and the provision of the Spirit. What is missing that has been promised is the idea of everlasting life. I mean, we have everlasting life, but we aren't yet equipped to live eternally. Um, that requires a new body. That's 1 Corinthians 15. That also assumes a resurrection. And so, um, so those are things that are yet to come that are in the age to come. So uh, we live in this framework of already and not yet. Something has been inaugurated and not consummated yet. That's correct. And, uh, and so, again, we are called to reflect what is to be even though we live in an era that has not yet gotten there. And so um, that's, that, that's the tension that we, you know, sometimes believers say, well, I got the Spirit of God, why, not, why am I not sinless? Well, because the work isn't completed yet. But we have been given the capability to walk with God and to walk faithfully with God. You know, the text says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so we've been given a capability we previously did not possess to be able to walk with God and be near God. And that actually, that idea is very important because in order to live in a way that is honoring to God and to live Christianly in the full sense of the term, you have to have the Spirit of God to lead and guide you into that, which is why the gospel is so important. People outside the church can't live that way, and so that's why you invite them into this sacred space. That's why we have mission. It's because, you know, you just don't go out and politically reform the world. Uh, that, that doesn't work. They need the internal spiritual equipment to be able to live in a way that's honoring to God, and it's the gospel that does that, and it is the forgiveness of sins and the provision of the Spirit in particular, particularly the second, the provision of the Spirit, which you can't get without forgiveness of sins, that allows you to put you in the position to be able to walk more faithfully with God, and uh, that's, you know, that's the calling of the church is to make that clear and then engage in the instruction and in the fellowship that encourages uh, that dependence on the Spirit of God. Dr. Bok, uh, when we think about this already not yet framework, uh, some of the aspects of our salvation that actually come at the end of the world, like our full justification, the fullness of our salvation and all of that, some of the aspects have been brought into time, into the present. So uh, would that be the same thing? Uh, would that be true of the wrath of God as well in some sense? Because when I read some portions of the New Testament, things like uh, John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So he talks in the present tense there. And uh, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men. So uh, has the wrath of God in that already not yet sense been brought into the present in some sense? Well, yeah, I mean, you're either in a harmonious relationship with God or you're not. I mean, that's, that's what those passages are indicating. And the, and the fallenness of the world is designed to show several things. Uh, our, our separation from God, the presence of the impact of sin. Uh, there are a lot of things that that is designed to show just in general. In fact, Romans 8 describes it as creation groaning until it gets to the full redemption of uh, of of humanity so so this this longing for the restoration which christians have entered into but others have not uh leaves them uh, leaves people exposed to the possibility of the judgment of god when you started to ask the question i thought i was going to answer by talking about the way in which the day of the lord works which is another way to think about this and that mm -hmm. is the day of the lord in joel was a locust play happened centuries ago, um, you know, long before the coming of Christ. Uh, 
And then there's the reference to the day occasionally in which, or the imagery of the day of the Lord, which refers to other very significant disasters in the history of Israel initially, and then looking towards the day, the day of the Lord kind of par excellence, um, that is the end. And so this idea of, of judgment showing itself periodically to remind us of who we are and where we stand and our need to be properly connected to God is something that is uh, a reality. And so these passages on the wrath of God abiding or being there, part of it is, part of it is the looming reality that if you are outside of a relationship with God, you are destined for wrath and that that is the position you're in if you're not connected connected to Christ. So part of that is what's going on there. That's part of the presence and the present tense idea of the wrath of God. Uh, but ultimately, um, someone's relationship to God is, is connected to the way in which they have responded um, to Christ or the way they've responded in general to the creation that gives evidence of the presence of God. You know, Romans 1 speaks about God being evident in the creation and that being suppressed by people. And so that's why the wrath of the passage that you read uh, from Romans 1, that's why the wrath of God is there. So, so yes, there is a sense in which the wrath of God is upon us, uh, upon those who don't believe, uh, because it looms as the end to which they are headed if they do not participate in the redeeming plan which God offers as a gift to be received and to be uh, provided for by what God does by his grace in forgiving our sins and giving us the spirit and bringing us into relationship with him. But God doesn't bring people into relationship with him uh, without their response of faith uh, that, that uh, then leads them into that relationship. God doesn't, in one sense, force himself on someone. He, um, he brings us to a point where uh, where we become responsive, and in that response, we join in, and then we move from wrath, if you will, into uh, the reception uh, of God and the acceptance of God. Justification means to be declared righteous, uh, which in a simple way could be to be accepted by God. Um, and so to be declared righteous is to have your sins forgiven and to be, and then the product of that justification is sanctification. You're set apart. And then that process of sanctification, but it, in one sense, is positional. You are holy once you believe in what it is that God has done because Christ's work cleanses you. Uh, on the other hand, you're in the process of becoming more holy in your own actual experience. And so, you know, when you think about salvation and moving from wrath, if you will, into life, there's justification there's positional sanctification that sets you apart because you've been declared righteous. There's the growing in righteousness in your actual life. And then there's what's called glorification in which you get a perfectly redeemed body a to in a totally righteous environment. And then um, that's, that's the culmination of the individual process that's tied to what it is that we believe in when we come to Christ. So within the framework that you just mentioned and talked about the wrath of God, uh, it wouldn't be right to specifically look at one pandemic and say, this is the wrath of God or manifestation of his wrath, isn't it? I wouldn't do that. Uh, I wouldn't say it that directly. I mean, you could do it, but the, w the way I would prefer to say it, in other words, it's a little bit like the question uh, about the man who was healed blind. You know, who sinned, mm -hmm. him or his parents? And Jesus said, no, this took place to glorify God. The way I would look at the pandemic is to say it's a reminder of the fallenness of the creation and our vulnerability as mortal beings. Uh, and in the midst of that vulnerability as mortal, be as mortal beings, uh, we're designed, because we're made in the image of God, for a relationship with God that we need to take seriously. And this is a reminder we're not gods, we're not in control of the world, we're not in control of what goes on around us, that, that uh, that the creation and God's work and role in it is in his hands, and we need to be properly related to the creator God. Um, and so, so I wouldn't specifically tie it to the idea of judgment. Well, this, the distinction I'm making is a fine one. I'll recognize that. But, but I would rather say that, it, that what, what all these actions of God are about the reminder of our mortality and our accountability to God are reminders we are not God's. 
Right. We are not God. And in the midst of the disorientation that we feel, and in the midst of the uncertainty that that produces, we get that reminder. We get it emotionally, as well as intellectually and in the terms of our reality. And then the question becomes, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this disconnect that you feel? And are you going to pursue a proper relationship with God and, and then think through what that involves? So I would rather, I would, do, I would say one other thing that the pandemic is supposed to do. A pandemic, because it reminds us of the fallenness of the world, should also induce our empathy for the condition of humanity apart from God, uh, what is called lament. And, uh, and most laments in the Bible uh, allow people to, um, to feel the pain of what it is they are going through, being disconnected or disoriented. Yet in the end, lament turns to trust to God, that the answer for lament is turning to God. So you can think about it in terms of pushing us towards lament and sympathy for what it is people are going through. And I identify with that. But it also reminds us we're not gods, which is a reminder that we probably ought to think about how we are, are connected to God and should be connected to God and connect that way. So that's one step short of saying this is definitely a judgment right. on people, uh, but it, it goes in a similar kind of direction. Right. Switching gears, Dr. Bach, uh, Paul talked about our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love that phrase. So from a pre-tribulational position, Dr. Bach, would you please talk to us about what is the rapture and, uh, and what happens at the rapture? Well, the rapture simply says, 1 Corinthians 4 is the passage where this is discussed, and it simply says that Jesus appears, uh, we meet him in the clouds, we're transformed in that process, and uh, and we are, are uh, we are then equipped for the eternal life that comes with the consummation, and this comes at the, uh, before the tribulation. So we, we don't go through the tribulation in the pre-tribulation model, and uh, and and so we're transformed then, and uh, it's called the blessed hope because that is the signal that the beginning of the consummation as we will experience it uh, is taking place uh, and we've moved from if you will the already period into the not yet period of the and, and moved towards in a big step towards the age to come. Dr. Bach, uh, you've written a lot on this. Would you please give us uh, three very strong arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture? Well, I think the most important uh, argument comes out of the Thessalonian epistles that says we are not we are of the day and not of the night. And so the picture here is of not experiencing um, not experiencing the scope of the judgment that is the tribulation period. The tribulation period is described as being such a um, omnipresent, comprehensive kind of judgment that the idea that you could be on the earth and escape it is very, very hard to accept. Now, there is, you know, some people will say, well, it's kind of like the Passover when the death of the firstborn where, you know, all of Egypt's firstborn died and but Israel was protected. So you can conceive of that being the case, but the way in which it's described being so comprehensive all the earth involved, etc. A series after series of, uh, of disturbances, if you will, in the creation, etc. It is hard to conceive of believers being able to escape the impact of that while all that disruption is going on. So the picture of being of the day and not of the night and the picture of the day of the Lord as being a, uh, a time of, of judgment, a time of darkness in many ways. Uh, as God sorts out the, the, uh, and establishes righteous and sorts out the unrighteous. Um, that is, in my mind, the argument. Uh, it, you mentioned three, but uh, to me, this is the argument that's bigger than any of the others. Um, the other, the other, another argument that is related to a particular view of how Israel is seen in the scripture is the idea of Daniel's 70th week. Um, 
and the fact that we have this week, we've been through the 69 weeks of Daniel, but we have this week hanging there that makes up the tribulation period that is left that has particularly Israel in view and Israel's history in view, which suggests that the church, which although it's made up of Jew and Gentile, is predominantly Gentile, um, is, is not so much the focus. And so, so that suggests the idea of, of the church as an entity uh, not being uh, the focused part of that last week. And the church, uh, defining what the church is, is important institutionally. Um, the church is, represents the presence of Jesus through the Spirit in the midst of his physical absence. Mm -hmm. Okay? We don't see Jesus now. We, we sense him. He's present, etc. But, you know, you don't hold him like the disciples did or the apostles did during his ministry. In the millennium, he's going to be visibly present. It's a different structure. It's a different institution. It's a different thing. It still is the vehicle and the organization, the structure to which God has placed salvation and through which salvation resides, but it's a different structure. And so that transition, which is represented and takes place in the midst of the tribulation period, also suggests that, that the church, which is of the day and not, not of the night, will not go through it. So I've given you two. Those are probably the two most important. And, uh, you know, some people have a list, as I think Dr. Walbert had a list as long as 50. But those, in my uh, mind, are the, are the big two reasons for thinking about the possibility of the rapture being pre-tribulational. Dr. Bach, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul uses this language uh, of saying that he will rescue us from the coming wrath. Uh, do you think uh, Paul, in chapter 5, when he discusses the day of the Lord, he's expanding on the concept? Yes, I mean, that, that, the, the idea of not experiencing the judgment of God, some of which is associated with what goes on in the tribulation, is exactly what I was talking about when I talked about the contrast between the day and the night. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that we're, that it's, very, it's very much the same conversation. That's, that's a wonderful hope that we have, that we will not go through tribulation. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and the bigger, the bigger hope is, is that we get to be transformed so that we can eternally be with God. I, I, I'm pretty sensitive about the fact that salvation is not about missing out on something. It's yeah. about who you gain through salvation. What you gain is a reconnection to the Creator God. And I think yeah. sometimes we frame salvation in such a way that we say, oh, well, at least I'm not going to hell which is true and nice. I'm not belittling that. But the bigger thing is not what you miss. The bigger thing is what you gain. And what you gain is this relationship with the Creator God that you were designed to have. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, this will be a really mundane illustration, but it's like being an electric plug, okay? If you're not plugged into the electric socket, being an electric plug is meaningless. But the moment you get plugged into the electric socket, all this power and capability is going through you that you didn't previously, that you weren't previously having access to. That's what we're talking about. Right. Yeah, I was coming to that, Dr. Bob. Uh, I, think, I think that's why Paul uses that language in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, when he talks about rapture, he says at the end of it, and we will be with the Lord forever. Exactly. And, and so the point is not what you've left behind, but where you land what you're taken to, what you participate in, etc. cetera. And, uh, and that really, um, how can I say that, promotion of status is part of what we're talking about. I mean, after all, you go from being an unclean thing to being set apart for God and being in his hands and being in his holy space and him being in you and connected, etc. All that is, is what is important. It's, and, and if I can, this is an aside, but it's a good chance to make the point when we share the gospel and we emphasize only forgiveness of sins and we don't talk about the reception of the spirit of god not not in a not in a charismatic pentecostal sense but the idea of the indwelling work of the spirit guiding us and residing with us if we don't talk about that we've only talked about half the gospel the whole point of forgiveness of sins the whole point of having your sins covered and your sins forgiven 
is to render you clean so now you can experience the presence and enablement and the direction and the guidance of God through the Spirit in, in your walk, which is a step-by-step -step daily thing, which the Spirit of God enables you to be able to do. And so to talk about forgiveness of sins only and not talk about the reception of that relationship with God actually truncates the communication of the gospel. And the, and the big point, in fact, Paul says this in Romans 1.16, you know, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The word power is depicting this enablement that you're given by the Spirit. That's Romans 6 through 8, if you will, that completes the gospel. And without it, you've only got a truncated gospel. And sometimes I think we preach the gospel in such a way that we truncated the expectation for people and we get truncated disciples in the process because we have not said to them, well, what you're actually entering into is not just forgiveness. You're actually entering into the ability to be connected to and be guided by God from this day forward. You know, and we put marriage vows on it, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do you part. Only the beautiful thing about the gospel is there's no death to part. You've, you know, that's for eternity. Right. Dr. Buck, you mentioned uh, about the future of Israel. And uh, I just wanted to bring that topic up here and ask you um, how the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and what happened to Israel in terms of the Declaration of Independence in 1948, how do these major events feature uh, in the last days? Well, the, the teaching of Scripture is, is that Israel as a nation is under judgment for covenantal unfaithfulness and not being receptive to the disciple until she says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Luke 13, 34 and 35. Um, the picture of the role of Jerusalem being, uh, being overrun by Gentiles during, uh, until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled is another picture that we get from Luke 21. Um, and then we get heaven holding Jesus until the times of refreshing come. And, that's, and then that's when Peter in Acts 3, 18 to 22, looks back to what the Old Testament tells us about what is to come. So with those three passages in place, I call them the until passages because it talks about the status of Israel until she believes, which fits in also with Romans 9 to 11, that Paul is seeing a time when Israel as a branch that is now broken away will get grafted back in in the future. Um, so there is a time anticipated when Israel will be responsive as a people, not just as individuals, to what it is that God has done. In Romans 9 to 11, the amount of believers coming out of Israel referred to as a remnant, but there's more than a remnant ahead. And so so this idea is that there will come a time when Israel is, res re is responding. What 1948 shows is that um, God is quite capable of bringing back the people of Israel as a people. Okay? Um, he's gathered them into a nation which really didn't exist. I think in the 17th and 18th centuries, if you said Israel would be back as a nation in its own land, a lot of people would say, really? Uh, but, of course, that's what we've we've seen. So 1948 shows the capability of that promise coming to fruition. Whether it is that promise coming to fruition or not is another question. Some people say yes, some people say no. But it certainly shows the capability of being able to go there. And so, um, so 1948 is, is significant in that regard. Uh, it's a little bit like the pestilence question you asked earlier. I mean, is this the end or not? Is it a sign of the end or not? Well, it depends. Uh, is it the end? We don't know that. Is it a sign of the end? We, it could be. Um, is it an indication that what's described at the end is certainly possible and is capable of taking place? Absolutely. And so um, that's, I think, the, the way to see 1948. All right. So, uh... Dr. Bach, uh, from the scripture, we can clearly assert that uh, ethnic, national, territorial Israel does have a future. That's correct. And, uh, but in an interesting way, um, because sometimes when you get into the discussion of the land and the discussion of the role of Israel, it can come across as a kind of nationalism, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Israel at the expense of Gentiles. Let me say it that way. 
That's not the way the New Testament portrays it. It's Israel serving Gentiles or in connection with Gentiles. That's that highway from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria. That's the, yeah, that's the picture that you get uh, of this unity. In fact, in, the, in, the, um, in these passages I'm talking about, um, Assyria, Egypt, and Israel are seen as three partners in the worship of God that takes place in Jerusalem. Three equal partners in the worship that takes place in Jerusalem. So I like to tell people if you want an analogy, and I think this works, the best analogy I can think of is the European Union. In the European Union, everyone is a member of the Europe, everyone who's a member of the European Union is a member of the European community, but you still have the French, the Germans, the Italians, etc. You know, you have national identity on the one hand, and yet you have a shared identity on the other, and the capital of the European Union is in Brussels, in Belgium, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, so, so you even have a capital city that's located in a particular country, but everything's, everybody's benefiting, at least theoretically, uh, if you're the British, maybe you disagree. Uh, but everybody's benefiting from what it is that's happening in the Union. And so that's the analogy that, uh, that I see when I think about what the kingdom is going to be like. It's, cent it's, it's centered in Jerusalem. It has a hub in Israel. But everybody's benefiting from the presence of Christ who belongs to Christ. I think that's a great illustration, Dr. Bob. So... Uh... The inclusion of the Gentiles does not mean the exclusion of the Israelites. Isn't it? Exactly right. And, and, or vice versa. The inclusion of Israel doesn't mean the exclusion of Gentiles. Uh, there is a shared benefit that everyone is, um, is experiencing, but there also is, with the view of the kingdom and the idea of a physical return of Jesus, a localization to that work which is going to be centered in Israel and in Jerusalem. Right. So, Dr. Bob, coming back to uh, the tribulation period and, and the last days, when we talk about that, um, we were talking about some of the birth pangs, and, and, and you described that very clearly. Um, so, what's happening right now uh, is building up in a way where, after the rapture of the church, it leads to the actual birth pangs that Jesus described. So well, the actually, the birth pangs, the birth pangs uh, are everything that I've been describing that are a part of the Olivet Discourse. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus says this is beginning, it's like birth pangs. So the birth pangs extend really uh, all the messianic claimants, the disruption, etc. Those are the beginning of birth pain. Now, this is, this is obviously a long, how can I say this, a long birth process that we're in the midst of. It's no different than the language of Romans 8. Creation groans until the redemption. Okay, what causes the groaning? What causes the groaning is the birth pangs. So, um, so that's the imagery that we're dealing with. Right. So, so what is the qualitative difference between now and the tribulation period after the rapture of the church? Is it it's the presence the of the Antichrist and all of that? It's the presence of the Antichrist, but it's also the intensity of the disruption. Uh, it, it's going to be a far more intense period of disruption. Uh, some of it triggered by the Antichrist. Uh, some of it looking like at one point the Antichrist has, has tamed it, if I can say it that way. But, uh, but this seven-year period is an intense period of suffering and disruption uh, uh, that, uh, that will continue and, and lead into... Uh, the return of Christ, because Christ is the only one who can fix it. And the second part of it is called the Great Tribulation, isn't it? Yeah, the Great, I, I actually think the, the Tribulation and the Great Tribulation are pretty much the same. Uh, you know, there's an overlap there. I mean, you call it Tribulation, some people will refer to that seven-year period of intensity as a whole as uh, great tribulation. Some people will make a distinction in that the first half of the tribulation is not as intense as the latter part of the tribulation. And so some people will use the language of great tribulation to refer to the second part of that. So sometimes you get that language. And that is an accurate description of the movement within the tribulation, for sure. Coming back to the gospel, uh, Dr. Bach, uh, 
we have been entrusted with the gospel, and uh, like you rightly said, uh, we should not look at the gospel merely in terms of what we escape from, but in terms of what we get. And uh, Paul is talking about the gospel as a fulfillment of God's covenantal promises in the Old Testament. Uh, would you would you please uh, talk about the urgency right now, as we near the end of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth? Well, the urgency has existed, as we've talked about, literally from the moment that, uh, that Christ came and gave the church the assignment. Uh, that urgency has always existed. And in part, the urgency is a function not just of when the return's going to happen, but of our own mortality. Um, the urgency that it, it comes is, is that, you know, once you die, your fate is determined. Uh, right. And so, so you know you don't know how long that's going to be um you know some people live to be 60 70 80 90 or you know a few people even 100 but uh but other people die earlier um uh, suddenly unexpectedly you know there are accidents and that kind of thing so the urgency is a function both of the if i can say it, the divine calendar but it's also a function of human mortality um, and this is why scripture urges people, you know, to seriously consider the gospel, to take it under consideration and decide, you know, even today is the day of your salvation, even in this moment right now. Because the danger is the more you reflect on the gospel and don't embrace it, you move into a position where you put yourself perhaps in a position of, ne of never embracing it, which would be considered from a biblical perspective one of the greatest tragedies in fact, it is the greatest tragedy, the greatest mistake a person can make. Right. Uh, Dr. Bach, uh, is it still true today that the gospel is to the Jew first? Yeah, I mean, in, again, in the sense that uh, in, in the sense that it was intended for and the Jews were described as being the people who are near as opposed to Gentiles who are far off. So if you... Mm -hmm. Think of it spatially, if you will. Um, they're the ones who are but in the best position to be responsive to what the gospel is. Uh, they had the covenant background, the covenant promises, etc. Uh, the promise was initially, it was their Messiah. It's the God of Israel that we're talking about. That's the language you often see in the Old Testament. The New Testament, he's described as the God of Abraham, you know, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, so, you know, so you get that sequence. So, yes, uh, it's to the Jew first because in the movement of salvation history, um, the, the Jew was at the front of the line. They were the, they were the nation through which the promise was going to come. And so, yes, uh, the, the gospel is to the Jew first and to the Greek. It, it's, a, it's also illustrated in Paul's own method of evangelism whenever he went to a new city the first place where he stopped was he didn't stop at the first baptist church he didn't stop at the first presbyterian church he didn't stop at the first anglican church they didn't exist okay he went to the synagogue and started there with the jews and then eventually would turn his attention to gentiles so um so yeah so the idea that the gospel is to the jew first uh, is important. Of course, in the church, what it's become, because the gospel has gone out into all the world, and there's so many Gentiles in the world with whom the gospel is being shared, is um, it's not to the Jews first, it's whether it's to the Jew at all. And, uh, um, and of course, the point of saying it's to the Jew first is to make the point that Israel is still included in the, commi in the call to the church of the Great Commission even though um, only a few Jews have responded. That's actually the point of Romans 9 to 11 in the book in which you get the expression to the Jew first, is to make clear that Israel has not been left behind by what God is doing among the Gentiles. In fact, in Romans 9 to 11, the point is made that Gentiles responding to the gospel puts, puts um, Israel in the position of be, perhaps being jealous of what it is that Gentiles have that will draw them right. to the gospel. So that's a very, very important idea in thinking about this Jew-Gentile question that you've raised. Again, coming back to what we said as a summary, the inclusion of one is not to the exclusion of the other. Exactly. Yep, exactly right. And, and going either way, it doesn't make right. any difference which way you go. Right. Uh, Dr. Bob, one last question. Uh, 
living in the midst of this pandemic and seeing the virus spreading around the world and a lot of death toll rising, um, I want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, I know you've written a lot about the historicity of the resurrection, but I'd like for you to speak uh, not so much about the historicity of it, but the significance of it for the believer, the confidence and the hope that we get uh, because of the resurrection. Well, the resurrection is God's vindicating act on behalf of the claims of Jesus. Jesus was in a tomb because the debate was, has he blasphemed God by claiming to be able to sit with God? Or is the claim to sit with God a promise of something God will do that will show who Jesus is? Those were the two options on the table. The resurrection was God's vote in that dispute. He said, this is not blasphemy. If it was blasphemy, he never would have raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus had it exactly right. I, he, I, you're going to see me seated at the right hand of God one day. You're going to see me sitting with God in heaven. Who gets to sit with God in heaven and participate in the distribution of its benefits? What does that say about the authority of the one who gets to sit at the right hand of God, etc.? So this is a vindication of who God is. We usually preach and teach the resurrection as he's alive one day and we'll be alive one day too. That's also true. But in my view, far more important is the idea of, of why that matters. And it matters because Jesus sits at the right hand of God, distributing the benefits of salvation. He's the one who qualifies us to be forgiven of our sin, and he's the one who, whose distribution of the Spirit, which comes from the Father through him, uh, sanctifies and sets us apart to God and makes us holy by giving his Spirit within us when we respond as a result of that forgiveness. And the vindication of who does that, the, the Son of Man, the Son of God, uh, the, the Lord who sits at the right hand of God the, the Father, uh, you know, the one who's in the middle of the Trinitarian transaction of salvation, the promise comes from the Father, through the Son, by means of the Spirit. All that becomes reality and is shown to be reality by the resurrection that, uh, that God undertook on behalf of, son, of the Son to testify to who the Son is. That's ultimately the theological significance of the resurrection, which undergirds everything else that we believe about the resurrection and everything else that we believe about eternal life. All right. On that note of encouragement and hope, uh, we come to the end of this program. Dr. Bach, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being so generous with your time. And thank you for your love for the church worldwide. May the Lord continue to use you in manifold ways to bless this church. And thank you to all of you as well for joining us. Uh, I'm sure all of our prayer is the same. It's Maranatha. Dr. Bach, would you, would you want to say something at the end? I just was going to say thank you for the privilege of having the time to interact with you, you all. And, uh, you know, the hope that we have is a deep one and very much worth swimming in. Thank you once again, Dr. Bok, and uh, may I request you to uh, pray for the church here in India and the Middle East and even worldwide, please? Sure. Father, we do thank you for the privilege we have of, first of all, being made in your image, and then your work of reclaiming us to yourself through the offer of your Son, forgiveness, and the gift of the Spirit, the gift of life, the things that we've been talking about, the hope that we have, and we thank you that... Uh, that the situation we find ourselves in is not the final situation that we will find ourselves in one day. And for those of us who have responded through Jesus Christ, we just thank you for the privilege of your goodness and grace and kindness of your gift of salvation. We do pray for the church in India. We pray for the church in the Middle East. We pray for the church globally and in this great throng that one day will be gathered together to praise you from every tribe and every nation. And we also lift up and pray for those who don't know you and pray for the church in the midst of its mission and message to take the message of the good news to such people. And we pray that by your leading guidance and spirit that people will come into this new relationship that you offer through Jesus Christ and experience the richness and the depth of life, an abundant life, a rich life that you are able to give. A life that is eternal, not just because it's eternal in 
duration, but because it's eternal in quality and it's eternal in its source. And we rejoice in the goodness and grace that that represents and pray that the offer of that hope to those who don't yet understand it would be something that your spirit would make clear to them and use to draw them to yourself. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you once again, Dr. Bok. And uh, you have a wonderful day. You too.